podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Welcome back to the Love Tennis Podcast with me, James Gray, and I've got Calvin Bett on with me for the first time this week. I don't know whether it's called a podlet or a podcast or whatever it is, but it's me and it's Calvin and it's tennis for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, there's loads to talk about. You will have hopefully already listened to my podlet from last night, which was recorded fresh in the aftermath of Serena Williams' retirement and everything that went along with that. We will, of course, uh, get Calvin's thoughts on that. We'll also talk about how the Brits have been going. Four of the men made it to the third round, but two of them are already out. Um, we'll talk about a couple of the shocks in the men's and women's draw as well. Not a great week for Greek tennis, for example. Um, and uh, we'll look forward a little bit to what's coming up in the fourth round. We're recording this uh, in between third round days, so Saturday morning US time. Um, so first half of the third round is done, second half is to come today, but we'll do our best to, to look at the fourth round nevertheless. Um, Calvin, as I say, I talked about Serena last night in in the podlet, but um, it'd be interesting to know what the impact of what's been going on in the US is like in the UK, because obviously she's been playing in the night session here, which is prime time, but kicks off at midnight. Do you think people have still been engaged with it, or is it kind of passed people by? Um, I think tennis people have. Um, you know, people who've got even a passing interest in tennis, I think that they have been tuned into it, but mm. not sure beyond that um, it's had much of an impact. But I don't know whether that's through with the timeline. I guess it's because although it's all a bit vague, isn't it? Because, like, is she actually retiring? <laughs> like, I think even she was asked. Even she was asked earlier this year, wasn't she? And she uh, earlier this week. And even she didn't 100% confirm that she's retiring. And then on top of that, she's been sort of three quarter retired for the last 18 months anyway yeah so it's not like a player who's i guess it's like when a football player retires they play a full season and then the last game of the season there's a big thing because they they retire and they go and a lot of tennis players like that they played a full season where whereas she sort of hasn't really played and hasn't 100 percent said that she's retiring yeah, it's funny, really. She did an on-court interview with um, Mary Jo Fernandez, and yeah, she she said, "Any chance you'll reconsider?" And Serena said, "I'm literally playing my way into this and getting better. I should have started sooner this year." And I sort of said, "Well, yeah. I mean, we we sort of all knew that if you like, you are still a very good tennis player, but you don't really play tennis, so you can't really expect to be particularly good." Um, I mean, she did play well, and she has over... To be honest, she has got better as, as the tournament's gone on, and I can see why she now says to herself, oh, maybe I could do this. But, you know, the, the reality is she wants to have another child, and, you know, as she gets older, those risk factors go up and up, especially as someone who, who had a traumatic pregnancy the first time around. Um, Calvin, in terms of the match itself, I appreciate that you won't have seen it because it was overnight, but the result for someone like Isla Tomjanovic who I thought coped with the pressure incredibly well. I mean, is, is this the kind of win that maybe makes a difference to a player? Like, I know playing against big players always sticks in your mind, but to win and to do it in that circumstance, it must, you know, that must be a bit of a feather in your cap. Yeah, I think so. Um, and she's kind of been on the periphery for a little bit, Tom Janovic, hasn't she? Somebody who could potentially break into the top 10 and hasn't quite. I've seen her play a few times, and I actually didn't think the pressure would get to her. Um, mm. like a few people thought that it was this wave of everything was going in the direction of Serena coming out on top but I've seen Tom Janovic a few times and she's a hard girl um, I don't think that those type of things bother her too much she, she thrives on them she was the girl who played Raducanu she knocked Raducanu out of Wimbledon last year when the, it was quite partisan the crowd mm. um, <laughs> yeah. and it didn't bother her one bit mm. Um so, and I've seen her practice and that kind of thing, and she seems a nice girl, uh, but she seems like somebody who doesn't um, doesn't suffer fools so much. And <laughs> she was there to win the tennis match last night. Yeah, um, it was funny what she said afterwards as well, because you know Serena did an on court interview and that was long and emotional and understandably so. And Tom Adovich sat there, but then she she actually did an interview which I was <laughs> almost surprised at, and she said, "Look, Serena's my hero too, and there was no pressure on me. I just turned up and thought she'd beat me." I don't know if I've ever, I don't know if I've ever heard a player actually say that that they like they turned up thinking they would lose. But you know, it was admirable that she came out and did what she did. And also, to be fair, that that she uh, 
that she said what she said because that that was uh, impressive. Um, yes, as you say, Calvin, we we think that's the end of Serena Williams, but she doesn't know, and we don't know. And I I, I sort of have this vision of her trying to come back, you know, after she's had a second child, you know, in maybe two or three years' time. I mean that that really would be yeah. Uh, at what forty three she'd be by then. It's it's quite hard to see, isn't it? Yeah, I, it, like you say, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, I don't know where she'd come back before that, though. Like, it's hard to see her just not playing a tournament and then rolling up at Wimbledon or US Open next year. I don't think she cares. She's not, she hasn't cared for any of the other tournaments for quite some time, to be she, honest. She said, in, yeah. she said in press, she did say, I, always, I did always love Australia, though. A sort of semi tongue in cheek, but I mean, who knows? Like, it, it, it's this kind of thing where it's almost more fashionable these days to retire and come back and then retire because you know it's the kind of it's the the comeback is almost greater than the the original arrival. It, it, I don't really, I don't like it. I think it's confusing and I think it's unreasonable, but. It certainly seems like it's it's a very boxer thing to do, isn't it? Like Floyd Mayweather. Now, uh, let's move on, because believe it or not, there are other players in this tournament, although you could probably quite easily believe that Serena Williams was the only one. That's quite how exciting it's been uh, watching her in her three-night sessions. Um, a load of Brits, or at least until quite recently, there were a load of Brits in the tournament. Uh, four British men threw to the third round of the US Open for the first time in professional history for the first time at all since i think 1933 uh andy murray jack draper dan evans and cam norrie all made it through but murray and draper were beaten yesterday murray um losing in four sets to matteo berrettini uh calvin afterwards murray was sort of pretty upbeat and said that he was pretty proud to be competing with these guys on this level given the the injury and and given his you know as he always as he said yesterday he said i've got a metal hip it's really not very easy um what do you make of this do you, do you think that losing in four sets in the third round to matteo berrettini is an achievement that he can look at and go well not bad yeah he was competitive he just made the third round of a slam beat a couple of good players um and he was competitive against one of the legitimate best seven or eight players in or in the world mm. um in that respect yeah I just wonder, and I was watching it last night, though, whether I think unt until there's a, a mental change in that he convinces himself that he can beat these players regularly on something other than grass, hmm. I wonder whether this is, this is it for Murray now. This is his ceiling as far as he can go tennis-wise. Hmm. Like we've, we've thought for a while, you know, once he gets his body right, this will improve. There's, there's more improvement to come. But he's kind of been at this level now for, I guess, all year. Because he hasn't really had any injuries this year. Nothing major anyway. Mm. And I think this is where he's at until mentally he beats a couple of those players and knows he can. And mm. I think, but as I keep saying, I seem to say this every week, to do that, he, he has to play more aggressively and take more risks. What did you make of his tactical approach to, to taking on Berrettini? Um, it's not tactics that are the problem. We always, I mean, I always say, it's not I always say, we have this saying in coaching that, that there's a difference between tactics and strategy. Right. And strategy is, strategy is how you play in general, what your type of, what your style of game is and what you do. Whereas tactics are what you do specifically for the opponent. Um, if, if, if you've noticed some weakness and that kind of thing. Tactics, he's always great. He knows the weaknesses of the opponent. He, he, he finds ways of finding those weaknesses. I think his problem is in his, his game style and his strategy in that he doesn't take many risks. He, he wants to get the ball in play. That's his thing. Keep the ball in play. Don't make errors. But as George said last night uh, in our group text, he's, he's also starting to make errors. Hmm. Yeah, but, but errors without going for anything. That's the even, even more frustrating thing. Rally ball errors. Hmm. It, yeah, because we always used to talk about how you know he didn't do enough for the midcourt forehand, and that that potentially remains the case. But also how he just didn't play that aggressive style that he kind of talked about. But if he's now just just making errors, as you say, it's 
well, I don't know how concerning it is because maybe it's just just a phase that he goes through. But it, it, he, he, what you can't deny is he's made progress. Like if you look at the the results that he's getting, they are getting better. But he, and I said it in the pod last night, and I don't know what you make of it, Calvin. But he's making slow progress, and he doesn't have a lot of time. Like he's thirty five years old. It, it's not you know the ceiling is getting lower with every week that goes by. It's what he wants to do i think that's the that's the question now mm. what what he sees as success from here on in now because i think now legitimately i feel pretty comfortable in saying that he's now a, a legit top 50 top 40 maybe player mm. that's what he can that that's where he is uh, who can have some decent runs at the slams and be competitive and that kind of thing and i think that, that there's merit in that and i think he could do that for another two year another three year maybe it's whether he wants to do that or does he see himself does he want to be world number one does mm. he want to win grand slams mm. and if he can't do that is he willing to carry on doing what he's doing so yeah. i guess it's one or the other does does he have much time in some ways yeah in some ways no i mean he always well there were times when we heard and he always sort of said and alluded to the fact that he wanted to and believed he could become world number one again. I, I don't think even he believes that now. Um, I think he probably is more realistic in his goals. But I'm absolutely sure he thinks he could win a Grand Slam. And I, I think he probably looks at it and thinks, well, if I can play one of the ones with no Djokovic and no Nadal, you know, I've got half a chance of nicking one of these random slams. Um, but But... He, he's going to have to hang on a long time or like hope there's another pandemic or you know <laughs> there's there's a lot of stuff that could happen that isn't really going to create opportunities for him and I, I also wonder how much it's like I've lost five really good years of my career like tennis players seem to peak at 30 31 these days yeah um to a degree but I also think it's style of play as well like you're going to get play he's going to get players like Berrettini like Alcaraz like, I'm trying to think who else falls well, into that. Who, it's hit huge. Yeah, the Medvedev is a bit different because Medvedev more makes balls. Mm. Um, but you can count him in that as well. Guys who can just out hit him. Who I don't know how he's going to play those players unless he can move like he used to play, mm. or unless he's going to start going big himself. Yeah. Yeah, he used that... to be able to beat those players. I mean, there's nobody who who hit bigger than Del Potro, mm. and he had Del Potro's number in the main. Um, mm. And none of the guys who are currently playing hit bigger than Del Potro. Mm. But what Murray could do is he could chase as well as anybody has ever chased, mm. and he can't yeah. do that now. No, no, it's not it's not feasible. Um, and it was kind of obvious actually from courtside yesterday that the power differential was just very very noticeable. Just the the sound the ball made off the racket, the the whole kind of rhythm of the rallies. He just doesn't have, you know. Do, obviously, he's never had the power necessarily that Berrettini has, but as you say, he couldn't get himself in the positions to to exact revenge, if you like. He can uh, though, James. He, he he he's a big guy and he strikes the ball big. I've been mm, on court with him. His mm. ball striking when he wants to is big, and and I think can hold up at the very top end of the game. The problem is, it, it's a scorpion and the frog analogy again. It's just his nature that yeah. he's never done that. He's he's been world number one. He's become one of the top twenty players of all time. He's become the world number one by doing this particular thing. Mm. And I think he still thinks that he can get back there by doing that. Yeah, yeah. Um, he also hit a one-handed backhand uh, passing winner yesterday, which was one of the most remarkable shots I've seen him hit, <laughs> and followed up with an amazing lob about two points later. So, And, and also uh, a drop shot uh, sla- smash. I mean, it was a complete mishit, but like, if you could do that again, where basically he lost the ball in the sun, hit the smash, it hit the top of his racket, and landed as the perfect drop shot on the other side of the net. It was pretty cool. I'd like to see him try it again. He... um. It was frustrating. The frustrating thing yesterday was how quickly it went away, because he was he'd got himself right back in it. Won the second set. He played uh, sorry third, third set, set yeah. brilliantly towards the end of the third set, and then to break, and then he gave away a silly game. But that can happen. You give away a silly game at the start of a set. That's that that happens at all levels of tennis. Um, even we saw Nadal do it um, the yeah. other day against Fognini. 
But then right at the crux end of the match, he played a great game to get to break point up and then made three errors in a row. Hmm. Three errors in a row to go from break point up. I don't, and I don't mean three points with an error in them. He missed three ground strokes in a row. Hmm. And um, and that's what, well, you, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know how he explains that to himself because that's something he would never do. Hmm. His whole thing had been, he's always been a little bit sloppy as Murray early on in sets, early on in matches. But when it comes to the end of sets, he's like a bear trap or he was like a bear trap. Like yeah. nothing got through him. And I imagine he's furious that he's basically gone out of the slam because because of unforced errors without hmm. going for anything. Hmm. Yeah, and he was missing volleys yesterday as well, which, you know, he missed two volleys right at the crux end of the match. Never does, yeah. yeah. Which is just uh, almost unheard yeah. of. Um, well, we shall see. Uh, he'll be back playing Davis Cup in Glasgow in a couple of weeks' time, and then he's going to play Labour Cup in London, so we'll get to see a bit more of him. And he says he's looking forward to playing in a team environment because that'll help pick him up from, from as you say, what's been an extremely disappointing uh, result to Berrettini. Uh, Jack Draper, speaking of very I, I think, I think sorry, he's right there. I th- so- Sorry, James. I think he's right there. I think those that that's a great sort of scheduling place for him to be now. Davis mm. Cup, where I imagine he'll win. Um and he's also got he's also gonna have in those two situations, he have somebody on court with him who he's not just gonna abuse. Um <laughs> like so he's gonna have Leon on court with him in Davis Cup and he's gonna have I guess he'll have Federer on court with him. Yeah, <laughs> and if maybe maybe he's going to take that could be the change in his career. Roger Federer going, why aren't you chuffing hitting the ball? <laughs> and then, you know, if he's if he's then not going to listen to him, then you got to think maybe that's that's not working out. <laughs> Roger Federer, the man who retired Andy Murray from the bench, maybe. Yeah, um, yeah as I say, uh, not the only disappointing British result yesterday. Jack Draper played brilliantly, got himself a, a set. Well, got level a set all, and then a break up in the third on Karen Hatchinoff, and then the old Draper injury curse struck again. Um, he tweaked what well, essentially tweaked his hamstring, but he said it was at the juncture of hamstring and groin. It's something he's done a bit before. He thinks it's only a two or three week injury, but that does rule him out of Davis Cup contention. There was some chat that they might try and crowbar him into the team. Um, it, I mean, Cowan, this is. This is what happens to Jack Draper, isn't it? Like it's happened for so many years, and it's just happened at the worst possible moment again. Yeah, sadly, um, and it's frustrating, um, and it's something Jack's going to have to get around one way or another, because he's going to be going deep in a lot of slams. Mm. I think we saw that now. Yeah. We saw that this week, and I think we've seen it all year. To be fair, that there's there's no there's nothing else that's going to prevent him doing that, other than getting his body sorted and mm. i do think he can do that you know that it's not these are not major injuries that when you look at when you look at some some athletes some place you know it's not del potro is it where just getting three or four major injuries um it then niggles but he gets a lot of niggles yeah gets a lot of these two three week injuries mm. um that you're gonna think he's gonna have to have chats with his physio or get a different physio or a different fitness trainer. I'm not suggesting that. That's probably come come out wrong there. <laughs> um, but um, somebody is going to have to sort Jack's body out. Yeah. And I don't think it's, you know, I expect they will. I expect somebody will. When, you know, when you've got a player who is getting lots of injuries, are there, is it a case of, you know, this is unlucky and, and or do you have to be proactive about it presumably and say I need to be stronger or I need to be more flexible you know so that my, my load is shared a bit more I don't think it's a work issue with Jack he's in phenomenal shape and he works as hard as anybody as of as I see around the NTC when he's training and that kind of thing I don't think for a second that he's because he's not in shape it may be that he has to do something different rather than something more mm. I'd say it's interesting. Um, well, we'll see how that goes. I was really impressed by how like level-headed he was about the whole thing. I'd have been absolutely like just distraught if I was him. But he um, he's obviously been through this before, and he's been down this road before, so he he knows how to deal with it. Um, we didn't have so much success in the uh, women's side from a British perspective. Emma Adekanu beaten in the first round by Elise Cornet. Calvin, a few days have passed now, um, and Emma Adekanu is kind of old news at the U.S. Open, but. You and I haven't spoken about it. Um, 
I mean, Elise Corne, I, th- I think I said it, I don't know if you agreed, but it was pretty much the worst draw Raducanu could have got. Of all the unseeded women, I thought that was pretty much as bad as it gets. Uh, yeah, I've, with some others, I think, as I said last week on the pod, I think it's that, apart from maybe three or four of the women at the top and three or four of the women at the bottom of the top 100, I think that any any of the other players in the top 100 are 50-50 against each other. Mm. And so... Yeah, Corne's a, a good player and she's had a good year in the slams. Um, but I think there's a few more that you could go for different reasons. They're just they're just good players. And and Emma, to be fair, she was seeded what was she seeded eleven? Yeah, yes. Yeah, yes. she's she's not the eleventh best tennis player in the world at the minute. Yeah. And so, you know, if you would say that realistically, what is she? She's probably fifty ish. Hmm. Um and then you'd say he's Corne, about the same, you'd say. Mm. Maybe. So, 50-50 match. Um, she's going to drop as far as 80 in the world now. Um, she she almost lost British number one status, which I know won't really bother her. But if Harriet Dart, who lost in the second round to Dalma Galfia, a match she really shouldn't have lost, and we can maybe talk about that in a minute. Um, she She's now down there, and it's going to change her schedule completely. I think from the way she's speaking and from having spoken to people around her, she won't take many wild cards. I think she will go and, you know, sort of play on merit, if you like, and that means qualifiers for premiers. It might mean qualifiers for some 500s, like 80 in the world does not get you main draw at every 500 by any stretch of the imagination. Um, doing that, Calvin, a little bit more away from the limelight, I suppose, do you, do you think this could actually be the making of her, like a, a little bit of grind at this sort of mid-level just inside the top 100? Um, I don't think I've I've been a bit miffed at some of the suggestions that it's a great thing and that the stuff about clean slate and all that kind of thing. I, I don't think that's how how it works. Um, I think she will just follow her path, hmm. and she's probably back on the path that she was on. But you know, the path that she would normally be on at that age and at that level of tennis. But yeah. I don't think it's. I don't see. I can't understand the idea that it's a good thing. That I, I I don't really get that. I'd rather be seeded eleventh at tournaments than ranked yeah. eighty in the world, if I'm <laughs> honest. And if only because it does keep you away from Swantec in the first round. Yeah. And um, you know, I guess the women's top ten's a bit all over the shop at the minute. So, um, but I suppose it's like it's what you've said before about when you're ranked there, it's very hard to get rhythm because you often do win one, lose one, lose one, lose yeah. one, win one, yeah. lose one. But the women's a bit different, though, because as I just said, anything's fifty-fifty. So yeah, yeah. I, I don't think it makes—I don't think it makes a world of difference either way. To be honest, um, she'll start winning matches. I'm sure of that. Um, but I think that will have more to do with just development and getting better at tennis than mm. than with because she's had the pressure. I don't know who this pressure is from. That's the thing. Like because all due respect. There isn't a great, there isn't a huge deal of interest from of te- women's tennis in Britain at mm. the minute. It's not, it's not something that everybody's plowing into watching. She hasn't been, she won't have been on the back page of a paper since in about eleven months and two weeks. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's it's tucked away in there. If you watch the, if you watch the early rounds of the tournaments when she's generally been playing, the stadiums are not really full. Yeah. Um, so I don't really know where this this. I think there's been this sort of mythical pressure that that's been on her. I don't know. Maybe there's some commercial pressure. About, maybe the uh, you know her partnerships. Maybe they're putting a bit of pressure on saying you got to start winning. But I don't think they would. I um, think most people, for most people in all walks of life, pressure is like uh, an internalized thing, right? Like I often feel very under pressure in my job. But the reality is that not many people are actually putting that pressure on me. I'm mostly putting that pressure on myself. Yeah. And yeah. high high performers, I think, do that a lot. And so, to an extent, I think it's Emma putting pressure on herself. I think it's also that, you know, she talks to the press a fair bit, certainly more than, like, a lot of other major sports stars in other sports. She talks to the press quite a lot. You know, myself and one other journalist sat down with her and chatted for 10 minutes before the tournament. You know, that doesn't happen to everyone. And I think when you get asked questions about is there pressure or how do you cope with the pressure, I think that creates the pressure because you're like, oh, I am under pressure, am I? I didn't realise. And So I do think there's an element of, and I don't want to say the media creates pressure, but I do think that that 
that can start to feel a bit odd. And I think she acknowledges, and having spoken to her about it, I think she acknowledges that this US Open was kind of a freak result and it has jumped her into a development stage that she isn't at. You know, as you say, she probably is about 50 in the world with her level. And she's all of a sudden being expected and kind of the public think, oh, Emma Raducanu, US Open champion, so she should win some more tournaments. And, you know, players at 50 in the world don't win tournaments very often. No, and I I, I agree. I, I do think she will put pressure on herself because all elite performers tend to. But I don't see how that's going to change now. She's still mm. going to put that pressure on herself because she still thinks, rightly, that she's an excellent tennis player. Yeah. And I think that anybody like that is going to think I should be winning. That that That's how they become elite tennis players. They think they're elite tennis players. Mm. And therefore, they put the pressure on themselves. I don't disagree on that front. I just don't see how this is somehow better. I don't think in her mind she's going to go, there's no pressure on me now. I can just lose. Yeah. Like that. that she won't think like that. She will still think that she can win most tennis matches that she plays, if not all of them. Mm. And it's interesting, the commercial thing, it's something that certainly fans and um, non-fans often cite as, oh, she should focus on tennis, stop doing all these commercial deals. I don't think she's not focused on tennis, but I do think that there will be sponsors, and, and it may not have filtered through to her, but she's a bright girl. It'll be in the back of her mind. You know, if you're British Airways and you've paid goodness knows how much, or Dior or Tiffany's, and all of a sudden your player is like going out first round of you know Podoroz or whatever she will definitely have worked out in her head like the numbers behind that and uh, so that I think will create a little bit of expectation um, to use a different word from pressure but I, 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 I yeah but I don't I mean I think for starters the stuff about people saying she should focus on tennis is just a nonsense I don't think there's I find it impossible to believe that she's taken her eye off the ball at yeah. all yeah in terms Agreed. of the tennis and that's not what i've seen or heard from anybody that yeah. I, I think her, her focus has been entirely on tennis and this is why you have agents like she's yeah. not going in there cutting the deal herself <laughs> and if she wants to do a photo shoot or something or if she wants to go to an event you know tennis they can only train so much it's four yeah. hours a day yeah you know what, what do you what do you want them to do at, at, at you know at night if it's a tuesday night and there's an event going on like she's a <laughs> she's a 19 year old girl yeah. she lives in london yeah like <laughs> yeah, get out more. Um, yeah, exactly. I think very, very sensible. Um, let, let's move on to the other um, British girl, uh, woman in the main draw, um, who's Harriet Dart, who who did well by getting through to the second round, which is a, a career achievement for her. Um, but she then was beaten by Dalma Galfi in straight sets. And Cal- so Calvin, I, I'll tell you, we went in and did press with her in quite a small room afterwards. And... Um, she got asked her first question, which is usually just sort of not, you know, how, tell me about the match. And she got about a word out and then burst into tears and, you know, was really, really emotional for, for you know, we sat. <laughs> it's very difficult in these circumstances. I don't know, you know, probably in normal life, you never just sit there and watch someone cry. Um, and, you know, <laughs> you, you sort of want to go give her a hug, but there's still a few COVID protocols here. And... So we just you just have to sort of sit in silence, and then Eleanor said, "Oh well, do you, are you okay to carry on?" And actually, credit to her, Harriet said, "Yeah, absolutely, come on." Um, but basically, we kind of talked it out, and and she said, "Well, I've played too many tournaments, and I feel pretty burnt out." And I wonder whether because she's now top one hundred, and therefore able to get into a lot of more tournaments and different tournaments as, as direct entry, I wonder whether it does happen that players kind of just gorge themselves and overload on the schedule because all of a sudden they can uh yeah possibly and look you know let's not beat around the bush there's good money at the tournaments yeah and they tend to be nice places Mm. so why wouldn't you Mm. um and and yeah and it's one of those things i don't think you realize burnout and that kind of thing is something you don't realize until it's happened otherwise if you thought you were burning out you wouldn't play some of the tournaments yeah but i think it's one of those that sometimes you go out and you just think yeah i'm just I'm done here, you know, and it, it's, um, but yeah, they, look, for, for guys, um, for players ranked around the same ranking as Harriet, you can't just be giving up the option of so many first, you know, even if it's first round, but you never plan on losing first round, but the prize money's decent and it's more money than they've ever earned. Yeah. So even just going and turning up and if you win a round, it's, it's, it's big money. Mm. Yeah. Um, in terms of Harriet Dart, I mean, um, she 
as I say, she's in the top 100 now. Is, is this kind of is this where where you think she'll settle out 80 odd in the world, or is there, is there an opportunity to maybe go a bit higher and make top 50 or top 40? <laughs> I'm a bit begrudged to say it because I didn't think she'd make that high. So yeah. it kind <laughs> it's of the, Cam, the know, Cam Norrie impact. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm not. You know, none of us are really experts in you know that we can comment on that because we all thought that she wouldn't get that far. So there's no point in us going. She can't go any higher. Yeah. So um, and again. You know, I keep saying it, and I, I, I don't mean to sound this derogatory. It's women's tennis. Like, would you predict anything? Yeah, would you, yeah, agreed. You know, would you if, if twelve months ago or eleven months and, and one, eleven months and three weeks ago, I would have told you that Harriet Dart had one match to become British number one, you'd, you'd think I was crazy. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Um, we've only got a few minutes left, so let's just rattle through a couple of things. Uh, shocks from the week. Uh, well, I suspect. The the women's top ten getting decimated is what we kind of expect at slams these days. So maybe the one is Stefano Tsitsipas um, losing to Daniel Galan uh, in the first round. I mean, he said he put a lot of pressure on himself, and we talk about pressure again. But he said Djokovic and Zverev not being there meant he realised he had a really good opportunity to try and become world number one by the end of the year, and that got to him. I mean, if Stefano Tsitsipas wants to be world number one, he's going to have to deal with that, isn't he? He's going to have to deal with it. He's going to have to deal with it against better players than Dominic Galan. Um, Daniel Galan. That, was it Galan he lost to? Yeah. yeah. Daniel but Galan, his name sorry. is Daniel. There is a Dominic Galan. Um, <laughs> right, okay. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not buying that from City Pass. I know something. He's going to have to sort his, sort his career out pretty soon or he's going to taper off. Yeah. Because he, he's, yeah, he's, he's a top 10 player and he's, he's a very, very good player. He should be approaching being, being dominant in slams now. Yeah. Um, and it looks like he's further away from that than he was 18 months ago. Mm. Yeah, it, it was such a weird match as well. We were watching, I think it was during a Serena match, so we were elsewhere, and someone just showed me their phone, and he was six love, four love down. So it wasn't just like, you know, he got shocked in a five-setter by this guy. Like, he didn't turn up for, you know, a, an extended period of time. It's really, really strange. I think as well in terms of it, it, this, this goes for City Pass, but also for a few more players who we've discussed today, another player in particular. Mm. Um, there's, I would say that at right now, and I was thinking this, I was flying back from Spain yesterday, and I was thinking this then that I think that not has not have tennis parents been so dominant in the game since the early to mid nineties as they are now. There's a lot more of them around, and and they seem to have. You know, we kind of, they're not as aggressive as they, don't get me wrong. The early to mid 90s was was bordering on criminal what they were doing. Mm. But in terms of the tennis, there's a lot more of them in the box around the practice courts than what there has been since I've seen since the mid 1990s. Yeah. And and is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, a bad thing, in a word, because <laughs> we haven't got long left. <laughs> That's fair enough. Um, a few other shocks. Uh, Bedosa, Contivate, Sakari all went out. Uh, in round two, uh, incredibly, they are all top four seeds. I mean, uh, there are much better players in the women's game than those three, with the greatest respect. Uh, it, George has written here: Is this the weakest top four in women's tennis history? I mean, uh, it, it's hard to think that it not be. I mean, it, it seems harsh, but yeah, yeah, I'd say so. I mean, they, they don't they don't perform consistently, which. It's, I had a, a, one for the listeners to, to think about as well. I, in terms of the women's tennis, where I was with some of the coaches I've been at Nadal's Academy this week at a Challenger, and I was talking with another coach there, and I, I voiced, I don't think women's tennis is in a great spot at the minute um, for, from and what we thought it would be a year ago. And, and there was a picture, a big picture of Steffi Graf on the court. And I made the point that I think that if you, if you could get a time machine and bring in the 1994 version of Steffi Graf, so that is 28 years ago, Mm-hmm. I think she'd still be world number one. And I think that, that that's how bad women's tennis has gone. If you brought in Pete Sampras from the same year, as, as great as Pistol Pete was, he, he wouldn't make the top 100. Right. Just because the, the game has ra- evolved. Yeah, with the same racket. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the game. I, I may have been harsh on Pete, though. He's six foot one, a great athlete and a best server in the world ever. So, um, <laughs> But, but the, you know, not def- I don't think he'd be world number one. Steffi, if you'd have brought that version in, she hits the ball harder than as hard as anybody now. She was a better player than anybody. I think that's that's weird to say to me that that the women's game is is now no further on than it was twenty five years ago in terms of at the very very elite. Mm. 
Um, let's briefly talk about the kind of title chances in the men's, um, because we've actually not talked about the men's very much, weirdly. Um, Rafa Nadal specifically has dropped a set in both of his matches so far, played a pretty awful match against Fabio Fanini that was just unforced error central, hit himself in the face of the racket, which I think is the most bizarre tennis injury I've ever seen. I mean, is this just what Nadal does? He warms into tournaments or what? Uh, I don't know if he does. I mean, he definitely doesn't warm into the French where he normally like cruises through the first three rounds losing about seven games total, doesn't he? Yeah. Um, I think he'll be at the back end of it. I've no doubt about that. I still think Medvedev will win it. Um, they might not win tonight. Do you think that's possible that he might he might be in a, a spot of bother? I mean, tomorrow night, in fact. Um, oh, any because... any time you play somebody who you lost to last time you played, mm. then he's playing Kyrgios, incidentally. Yeah. You know. Then any time you're in that situation, in, especially if it's recent weeks that you lost to someone like within the last month, then you're not definitely winning the match. Mm. For sure. I think he will win, but I think he's going. I think he's in for a battle. Yeah. And it'll be an entertaining one, uh, we hope. Uh, that's all we've got time for today. Uh, sorry for not being longer. We'll hopefully get Calvin back and maybe even some George if he can squeeze us into his busy schedule of drinking um, in, at some point in the next couple of days. Uh, as always, leave us a rating and a review wherever you get your podcast. That'd be great. And then uh, keep coming back. I'll keep trying to do more podlets. I've only got so many hours in the day and um, tennis finishing at half one in the morning doesn't help anyone. Sports Social Podcast Network.